be seated. So today's gospel reading, super familiar, the feeding of 5,000. We all love a good miracle story, and this, it's a pretty good one. Jesus is sitting around with the disciples, and, and the crowds are coming in the distance. And Jesus says, oh, we have to feed them. First disciple says, no way. <laughs> uh, there are way too many of them. We don't have enough, and we can't get enough to do that. Super scarcity mindset. Then the second disciple says, well, there's this boy. I mean, he has a couple of fish and a little bread. Everyone else looks at him like, are you dumb? I mean, look at all those people. But Jesus takes the offering from the little boy. And then, next thing we know, 5,000 have been fed, and there's food left over. That is abundance. People ask, how could it have happened? Could it have been 100% just you know, miracle? Jesus puts his hand on the breads and the fish and multiplied the bread and fish for everyone? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I actually like another explanation a little better. It doesn't make it less or more likely to have happened this way, but I like the way that it makes us think about what we have and how we make miracles in our own lives. So, do you know the story of stone soup? Probably, a lot of you do. Um, it is an old folk story. It was a story that likely had a long oral tradition, but its first version in writing was by Madame de Noyer, French pronunciation, you all can check me on that, um, <laughs> German. Um, <laughs> but she was an internationally renowned writer. Her version was published in 1720, one year after her death. And we don't know um, who told her the story, whether she'd heard it for many years, whether she read it somewhere that we just haven't found, or she just made it up. Um, but her narrative set the stage for this story to be told and retold by different authors who always changed the story just a little bit to fit their context. But the meaning behind the story always stayed the same. And I liked this version I found some time ago, and it goes like this. Once upon a time, somewhere in Eastern Europe, there's a great famine. And people jealously hoarded whatever food they could find hiding it even from their friends and their neighbors. And one day, a peddler drove his wagon into the village, and he sold a few wares and began asking questions, as if he planned to stay for a while. Oh, there's not a bite to eat in the whole province, he was told. You better just keep moving on. Oh, I have everything I need, he said. In fact, I was thinking of making some stone soup to share with you. He pulled an iron cauldron from his wagon. He filled it with water and built a fire underneath it. And then in great ceremony, he drew this ordinary looking stone from a velvet bag and he dropped it into the water. And by now, hearing the rumor of food, most of the villagers had come to the square or were watching curiously from their windows. As the peddler sniffed the broth and licked his lips in anticipation, hunger began to overcome their skepticism. Ah, the peddler said to himself rather loudly, I do like the taste of stone soup. Of course, stone soup with cabbage. Mmm, now that's hard to beat. <laughs> Soon, a villager approached hesitantly, holding a cabbage he'd retrieved from its hiding place and he added it to the pot. Oh, capital, cried the peddler. You know, once, once I had stone soup with cabbage mm, and a bit of salt beef as well. Oh, it was fit for a king. And the village butcher managed to find some salt beef. And so it went through potatoes and onions and carrots, mushrooms, and so on, until indeed there was a delicious meal for all. The villagers offered the peddler a great deal of money for the magic stone. <laughs> but he refused to sell, and he traveled on to the next day. And from that time on, long after the famine had ended, 
people would talk and reminisce about the best soup they had ever had. So the story has taken many forms over the year, over, over the many years, but the key elements always remain the same. First, there's a great need. People are scared by the great need, and it causes them to hoard the things that they have and not to see their collective blessings. Second, the peddler always proclaims that he has everything that he needs. And we can imagine that if he would have said, oh, I, I will make you some soup. I just need you know, some cabbage, a little bit of beef, and some vegetables. Everybody would have you know, drawn back and immediately gone back into their homes and shut the doors. But when he says, I have everything I need, and I want to share with you, people were enticed forward. They grew in optimism, and they had opened their cupboards, and they shared what they had, and there was plenty for all. And I like to think about this story in the context of our gospel reading. I mean, what if one child freely offered what he had, just a few fish and a little bit of bread, and by Jesus saying, I have everything I need, I will share with all of you. Slowly, people added a little bread, a little fish, a few vegetables. Maybe a baker was there and added a basket of bread or a fisherman, his latest catch. When we live with a sense of joy, there builds a sense of excitement and a desire to join in the movement. All of a sudden, the small thing that we are holding seems to matter. Well, I, you know, the, the small thing that you're holding, well, I could add this. And when everyone adds their part, there's plenty for all. And I love thinking about the miracle this way because it's so applicable in our own lives. Are we living a life of joy and abundance? Or are we closing our hearts with a sense that there's not ever enough and there'll never be enough? When we're working in God's kingdom, there are often two things that are happening simultaneously. First, there's an exterior event, the obvious and the visible. And in the Gospels, it's often the miracles, the miraculous occurrence that everyone can see. But alongside that, there's always something else happening. And it's on the interior, something that changes our essence, if we let it. And here, the exterior thing is the feeding of the 5,000. It's very cool, but it's just one meal. The interior thing that is happening is one, a change in perspective that there is enough and my small contribution makes it so. Two, a change in experience from being afraid and ungenerous to being full of joy and full of hope. And three, knowing that God can change our heart and the hearts of others so that all things are possible. And when we give of ourselves, our time and our talent, our money, we can tackle huge challenges in the world and experience profound joy. The act of giving transforms not just our outward actions, but our inward attitudes as well. And we move from a mindset of fear and scarcity to one of joy and abundance. And of course, St. Clair's knows this, right? That is why we say, grow in God to serve the community. The congregation does pull time and talent and resources together to give outside of ourselves whether it's working at the food bank, tending the garden, yarn work, planning activities for children, there are many ways to serve in this community. And we have a sense of joy and abundance about our church, and we have to have the same sense of joy and abundance about our church. On the exterior, we might look around and feel like we have limited resources. We can worry about our financial constraints, a lack of volunteers or not enough fill in the blank, but like the villagers in Stone Soup story, we have enough, and we have more than we realize. One of my goals as your interim is for this to be clear, that St. Clair's has enough. We are blessed. I want us to feel the joy of Sunday service and to feel the joy of abundance in our community. When we come together and share what we have, and we can accomplish incredible things. And that joy, it's contagious. 
People want to be where there is joy and where there is abundance and a sense of purpose. And we are that place. Finally, I want to consider the importance of sharing meals and celebrating community. One of the most powerful aspects of the stone soup and all of the feeding miracles in the gospel is how sharing a meal brings people together. I wish that I could have been a part of the dinner club um, that Martha led. It sounds like it was amazing. Um, communal meals become a symbol of unity and generosity and abundance. And sharing meals has always been fundamental to what it means to be in a community. You know, in the early church, we know that the um, believers gathered to break bread together, sharing not just food, but also fellowship and mutual support. These meals were a tangible expression of their faith and unity. And today, sharing a meal reminds, remains a powerful way to connect with each other. It provides an opportunity to just slow down, engage in meaningful conversations, and to strengthen our relationships. And as it so happens, this week, we have a great opportunity to put this into practice with our church picnic or potluck. We will come together and share a small something to make a fun picnic. And it's more than just a meal. It's a celebration of our unity and of our abundance. It's a chance for us to laugh together and to feel the joy and fellowship that comes with being together. And I hope that each of you do come and participate. Bring a dish to share, whether it's your favorite recipe or something simple you picked up at Safeway, which, by the way, is what I will be doing. <laughs> um, but come. Come for the whole time or just drop in for a moment. It's a practical way to live out the message of abundance and joy felt in this community. Holly's going to bring some games. Terry will have some crafts and games for the kids. Lynn is going to make us some lemonade. Mm -hmm. It will be fun, and I hope you are there. Bring your neighbor. Bring someone who hasn't been to church in a while. Bring your grandkids. Let's make some stone soup.